But since you're all, since there's so many of you here right away, uh, we can go ahead and talk about just a few things before we get started. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, first of all, we need everybody, once you find your seat, to please stay seated. Um, we, we don't want you to get up and move around because it can be distracting and upsetting for the birds. So once you guys find your seat, please stay there. seated. Um, we need everybody to stay very still because the birds can get startled. Um, we need you guys to stay quiet, please. And what else? Um, if you, we'll have time for questions. So if you guys do have any questions, we'll let you know when we're gonna have question time. Um, another thing, uh, Rachel Peregrine Falcon already showed us. We need you to be quiet, please, and sit down. Thank you. Uh, Rachel, so birds poop. Here's the thing, guys, birds poop a lot. And they will probably poop today, so if they do, just be cool. You don't need to scream or let us know or anything, we know. Um, so if they poop, be cool about it. Um, I think that's about it, did I forget anything? Sometimes they bait. That's right, thank you. And that's an important thing too. When we say that a bird baits, it means that something's kind of startled it and it tries to fly off of our hand. And as you can see, my little owl screech owl here, Sarah, she has little bracelets on her feet and they're attached to a little leash which is attached to my glove. And that's what, and Dawn has the same thing with Rachel Peregrine. So the birds can't fly around the room or anything, but sometimes they, they try, they get scared or something, something startles them and they, they might try to fly forward <clears throat> and they know how to get back up on our hand and that's called a bait. So you might see that happen today too. Just like that. Right there, oh, that was a bait. <laughs> so if they do that, it's, it's fine. Like I said, don't, don't get scared. Um, they can't get you. So um, yeah, just be cool. Well, maybe we should so, introduce ourselves. Yeah, I think now probably everybody's here. So, well, we are Raptology. We do wildlife education here in Iowa City and surrounding areas. Um, I'm Dawn, and I've got Rachel Peregrine Falcon right here, and this is Jan, and she's got Sarah Screech Owl. So a couple of things, first of all, Rachel has a lot of energy today. Um, these birds are not pets. These are not our pets. We don't hug and snuggle these birds because they are wild birds. Um, they're predators. We'll talk all about that. Um, but we have these birds. We're very, very lucky to have these birds to work with. Um, you can't have birds like this or any bird um, without proper permits from uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife and the uh, Department of Natural Resources, which we have. So um, we're able to bring these birds, um, take care of them, shelter them, um, and bring them out and introduce them to all of you guys. So. <clears throat> Do you want to start with Sarah or does... I can start with Sarah. <laughs> I'm going to add... You're going to start, aren't you? You're going to talk? I'll bring you a little closer. Maybe yeah, get the her close to the mic. microphone will <laughs> pick up her voice. Because being a tiny little screech owl, she has a very soft, quiet voice. And she's very curious right now about the room. You can see how she's twisting her head all different directions. So screech owls are one of the smallest owls in Iowa. And they probably live right here in Iowa City or wherever you live. They are active. Well, when would an owl be active? Who knows? Yes, at night. And these guys, especially late at night. You know, early in the evening, sometimes we hear the um, barred owl start to call or maybe the great horned owl call a little bit as it starts to get dark. But the screech owls wait until it's totally dark before they get active. So we, where are we at? We're usually in our houses, not outside, and we don't hear them or see them. But they are, they do share our neighborhoods right with us. So um, Sarah Screech Owl is, let's see, she is an imprint. She fell out of her nest when she was little along with another little owlet. And she was raised by people then. They, she was taken to a rehabilitator, somebody who takes care of any injuries they might, a wild bird might have that's had an accident like that. 
And Sarah imprinted. That means she's a little confused. She doesn't know really if she's an owl or if she's a person. So when you have a bird that's that way, that's imprinted, they can't be released back to the wild. They probably will not know how to hunt to find enough food to survive. And they may get too friendly with people, which is a hazard to the bird and to people too. So Rachel is now an education bird. She lives in a mew in Joan's back, backyard. She has a special, a special home where she um, has everything she needs. She has room to fly around a bit. She has special purchases, perches, and she eats mice that we provide for her. And we don't give her live mice. She eats mice that are already dead. Are you going to talk? OK. A little bit about owls. So we have two birds here, one that's active during the day and one that's active at night. So a lot of owls are able to share a hat, or raptors, <clears throat> birds that hunt for their food, are able to share a habitat because they don't compete with each other. They either hunt for different kinds of food, or they live in different places within the habitat, or maybe they're active during different times of the day. So these two birds do not really ever compete with each other because while, while Sarah is out, and about Rachel Peregrine's asleep. They don't fly at night. So that's how many creatures can share a habitat. Let's see. Sarah, where do you suppose she makes her nest? Yes. Yes, in a little hole in a tree. And I have a picture here of a screech owl peeking out the opening of its nest hole in the tree. You have to look really hard to see the owl, don't you? They are so well camouflaged that often, even if these little owls are sitting out on a branch and you walk by, you wouldn't notice them. They often snug right up against the trunk of the tree. And if you look at all of her beautiful colors, she blends right in. What's the word for that when something blends right into its habitat? There's a special word we use. Yes. Do you know what the special word is that we use? Camouflage. That's it, camouflage. Yeah, camouflage. <clears throat> so nature has provided her with wonderful camouflage to look like a bunch of tree bark. Yeah. OK, you have a question? Um, there's a bird right outside Oh, OK. Oh, we'll get that later. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, yes. There is one of our props came out. Is there anything you'd like to add about Sarah? Um, well, I was. I just wanted to say um, you can kind of see in the picture that we showed you guys. So you can see how she's got her little horns um, on the top of her head. Do you think those are her ears? Yes. Are those her ears? Yeah. Yes or no? Where are our ears located? Are they on the top of our head? Her ear tufts are just feathers, that's right. So her ears are about where ours are. Her little ear tufts there, her feather tufts, those are kind of, so if any of you have a pet cat, um, if you notice if they're in a bad mood or if they're angry or if they're scared, sometimes they'll flatten their ears against their head, right? And that's kind of their body language to let you know that they don't like what's going on. Owls are kind of the same. Their ear tufts kind of act in the same way. Um, she looks like she's in a pretty good mood right now because her ear tufts are standing straight up. So you can kind of kind of use those to judge their mood, but like I said and we talked about, they also provide really, really good camouflage. Because what they do is when she's standing against the bark of a tree, when her ear tufts, she kind of stands really still and she'll kind of pull her whole body up. And so her ear tufts just help elongate that and just helps her further blend into the bark of a tree. You know, they use a lot of body language. Mm -hmm. They can't talk like we can to communicate. <laughs> when I went to get her to bring her to the program, she was like, I'm not having any of this. And she was clacking her beak at me, and she was all <laughs> puffed up trying to look really huge and fearsome. Didn't work, though. <laughs> and she finally jumped on my glove and, and said, OK, I'll go and see all the kids. But body language is important with birds. Um, when she puffed up, she tried to make herself look big and scary. 
and how scary can something this big be? But Sarah um, also has some amazing adaptations. You know, she, she hunts with her ears, she has good eyesight at night, and she can see in the dark better than we can, but she really uses her ears to hunt. So owls spend a lot of time just sitting and listening. And then when they hear something rustling in, a gra in the grass, like a mouse, Sarah could hear a mouse stepping through the grass way back in the corner of this room. She can hear that well that far away. So that's kind of an amazing superpower she has. Her big eyes are, as I said, another sort of superpower. She can gather lots of light at night, whatever light there is in the dark of the night, and use it to see. Let's see, she also has this amazing neck. Have you noticed how she's been looking kind of all directions with her neck? If you watch her as she sits in my hand, you might even see her take her head and turn around and look backwards at the wall back here. And she might even keep going and looking at dawn. Her neck has more vertebrae in it than ours, so it's very, very flexible, and that allows her to do that. Her eyes, though, have a little bit of a, a problem. She cannot move her eyes in her head. You see how big they are? They take up a huge amount of space in her skull. So you can do something with your eyes she can't. So for just a minute, take your eyes, don't move your head, hold your head absolutely still, and look up at the ceiling, and then look down at the floor, and look at the person next to you on one side, and then the other way. Our eyes can move all those different directions, which helps us see things. Because her eyes can't do that, <coughs> nature has given her this wonderful, flexible neck. So she can quickly move and turn her head to see all different ways. So probably enough about you, Sarah. I think we need to get acquainted with yeah, Rachel. Yeah, Rachel here is feeling a little left out. I bet. So Rachel is a peregrine falcon. And this is, ladies and gentlemen, the fastest animal on the planet right here. She is faster than a cheetah. She's faster than a fish that can swim really fast. Um, these are the fastest animals on the planet. Does anybody know how fast they can fly when they're diving for their prey? I saw your hand first, I think. What do you think? How fast can she fly? <clears throat> All right, I'm going to stop you right there. Anybody else want to take a guess really quick? What do you Nobody think? can help her out. What's that? I'm sorry, I still didn't hear you. 105? That's a good guess, but she can go even faster than that. Peregrine falcons, when they're diving for their prey, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, they can fly almost as fast as 240 miles an hour. That is fast. That is faster than anybody should be driving, or probably anybody can run. Um, these guys are specially adapted to be apex predators. They're fierce hunters. She's got a little bit of an itch today, it looks like. Um, so peregrines are very, um, they're evolved to be able to, what they do is they hunt birds um, mainly as their source of food. Uh, uh, Sarah, owl here, uh, she eats mostly mice and little rodents, little critters like that. Um, Peregrine falcons, they eat other birds, um, not, not other raptors, although in the wild, a screech owl could be a meal for a peregrine falcon. We'll have questions in a little bit. Um, these guys hunt mainly pigeons, starlings, songbirds that you see at your bird feeder, things like that. Um, and what they do is pretty cool when they're hunting. They fly up really high in the air, and when they focus in on their prey, what they do is they tuck all of their, they tuck their wings, they tuck everything in. Um, but you can kind of see how pointy her wings are, um, her tail feathers she can make more pointy, um, but it really streamlines her so she's able to dive really, really fast. She flies up high in the air, 
tucks in and dives. And that's when she hits those really, really high speeds is when she's diving. And what she does, you can kind of see, I'll walk her around a little bit later so you can get a better look, but she's got pretty big feet. Um, I don't know how well you guys can see there in the back, but she's got big feet and she's got big, sharp talons. They're very, very sharp. And what she'll do when she is diving for her prey, she's coming at it so quickly, so fast. What she does is she balls up those big feet like this. And what she does is kind of punches that little bird that she wants to eat. And so that little bird is kind of knocked out temporarily. And before it even, before it literally knows what hit it, she's already got it and that's her next meal. So these guys are pretty impressive with how, um, how well they can hunt. <clears throat> Again, I don't know how well you guys can see there in the back, but peregrines are specially adapted um, to help them when they're flying so fast. Um, they've got what's called a nictitating membrane. They've got an extra eyelid, basically, that is they can see through it. So what they do is they'll kind of pull that across their eye so they can still see, but when they're flying really, really fast, it keeps their eyes from getting uh, dried out so they can still hone in on their prey. And another feature that they have, um, you guys probably really can't see very well, but in her beak, she's got her little nostrils on either side of her beak. And they've got a little cone in there, a little nodule that kind of slows the airflow. So when she's flying really fast, she doesn't just get a, you know, 240 miles an hour worth of air in her face, because that would probably be unpleasant. And you can probably tell too, you can see her beak, that she's got a really sharp hooked beak. And I forgot at the beginning to talk about what makes a raptor a raptor. So we mm -hmm. can talk about that right now really quick. One thing is their beak. Raptors have very strong, very sharp beaks because they tear meat from their prey. Um, some of them use their beak to, um, part of how they kill their prey, some of them, they will bite their, um, the back of their neck and sever the spine. Um, so their beaks are really, really powerful and really, really sharp. Um, poor little thing. Um, she's kind of showing us too. Another feature of raptors is their talons. They've got big, sharp talons for the most part. Um, our turkey vulture, uh, he doesn't have such sharp talons because he doesn't need them to kill any prey. So all the birds that kill prey, they do have really, really sharp talons and that helps them really grab onto what, what they're going after. So <clears throat> Rachel here, Rachel's named after Rachel Carson. Um, kids, you probably don't know who that is. Um, parents, I hope that most of you do. And if not, I would, whoop, I would urge you to uh, learn about her. She was an environmentalist back in the 60s, and she wrote a book called Silent Spring, which really explo exposed, exposed the dangers of a chemical that was wiping out wildlife, basically. Does anybody know what that is? You in the back there. What's that? I didn't hear. DDT, that's right. Good job. Good answer. So DDT was a chemical that we used, um, what was it, back in the 50s and 60s? Yes. Yeah. Um, is when it was really heavily used. And it it wiped out a lot of wildlife. It was really toxic and really hazardous to a lot of animals, and peregrine falcons were one of them. Um, these guys were almost gone from this part of the country um, not that long ago, really, back in the 70s and 80s. Um, they, what happened was, lots of energy. Um, what happened with the DDT is, um, Farmers and um, other people, they would spray it on their crops. The bugs would eat it. Uh, birds would eat the bugs. It just worked its way up the food chain, basically, until it hit. Um, these guys would, would be considered apex predators um, in the food chain. And so by the time it got to them, it made their eggs so brittle that they couldn't, um, when they would sit on them, when they would incubate their eggs, the eggs would just break because they weren't strong enough because of the chemicals. So. DDT was banned, and it's not allowed to be used anymore, thankfully. So these guys made a pretty strong comeback. Um, they can be found in a lot of different places around here. There's some peregrines that live on the US Bank building up in Cedar Rapids. 
Um, I've never seen them, but I've heard a lot about them. They, um, they like to nest in high, um, kind of precarious places. Um, they, they're cliff dwellers in nature, so they would nest along uh, bluffs, along a river. Um, like I said, buildings in an urban environment really mimic that same kind of um, structure as the bluffs, and so they would nest in places like that. Um, Rachel Peregrine here. So we talked about how Sarah Owl is imprinted, um, and she can't be back in the wild because she basically doesn't know how to be a wild owl. Um, Rachel here, um, unfortunately, she is with us because somebody shot her, um, which is a federal crime. There is um, a law called the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, and last year was the 100th anniversary of that act. And what that did is it protected birds from being killed for silly things like putting feathers in ladies' fancy hats and, and things like that, that we really don't need their feathers for. Um, so before that, these guys would be considered pests and vermin, and they would farmers wouldn't like them because they would take their chickens and things like that. So the Migratory Bird Treaty Act really, really helped birds out. and. Um, kind of gave them their rightful place as protected species in, in our ecosystem. You know, there's a lot of things we as people do that, that are hazards for these poor creatures. Um, you know, you talked about DDT, Don, and that was spread to control bugs, insects okay. on crops. Okay. And at first, people didn't realize how that would affect the bird populations. So that was something that happened long after the Migratory Bird Treaty occurred. So that the Migratory Bird Treaty started to protect birds from hunting, but then something else we humans did, like use chemicals, produced a new hazard for birds. And laws were then passed to ban DDT. And we as people need to keep kind of on top of things and make sure we keep supporting things that protect our bird populations. Birds everywhere are having a hard time of it. And part of it's what we call habitat loss. The, the environments they need to survive are disappearing due to our building new homes or building shopping malls as our cities sprawl out. We need to make sure we maintain habitat and home for these creatures. And there's like little Sarah Screech Owl. You're looking at me, aren't you? She, she will use a nest box. So a lot of different birds, something simple like making sure there's a box for them to make a home in that's appropriate will help them have a safe place to raise their young. Normally, she'd use a hollow in a tree. But if there aren't enough trees or the trees don't have hollow rotten spaces she can move into or a woodpecker hasn't been by to create a hollow that she can borrow, she will use an S box. So you can learn a lot about the birds in your neighborhood and some of the simple things you can do to help those populations out. Yeah. All right, well, I, can you think of anything else that we you know, can talk about? Joan, is there anything? We didn't <coughs> introduce Joan earlier. She's standing She's back here by in the, the back door. There. <laughs> and she takes care of these beautiful creatures. Yeah. <laughs> and it's our privilege. Go to, go to Quest. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So. You have. Really Thank quiet. you very, very much. The birds have yeah. been, yeah. So I would say let's open it up for questions. And yeah. maybe we'll do a few minutes of questions. And then anybody who wants to go, can, we'll have the folks who need to go, then go. And then anybody who's a real bird nerd can stay. How's that? OK. We'll do a couple questions. Yeah. You had your hand up. What's your question? How long have we had these birds? Let's see. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. Rachel, we've had for two-ish, yeah. year and a half maybe, two years. Mm -hmm. um, and Sarah's been around for about a year. Yeah, year and a half-ish yeah, or so. Yeah. Um, some of our other birds that we have, we have a red-tailed hawk who's been, I, I think, think ten, maybe 10-ish ten. years or so with Joan. Um, turkey vulture, he's maybe three years, something mm -hmm. like that. So some of the birds we, um, we've had for a really long time, some are, are sort of new. Um, yeah, you've got a question back there. What's your question? 
How many species of owls are there? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, how about let's do how many species of owls are in Iowa? Is that good? Okay. Uh, let's see. There's great horned owls. There's screech owls. There's barred owls. There's and then there's barn owls. Barn and everybody owls. confuses barn right. and barn. Um, and barn owls are rare. Long-eared. Mm -hmm. In Iowa? Yes. Western okay. Iowa, yes. Hmm. And sometimes there's a few that migrate down and visit from the mm -hmm. north. Northern sawwood owl, um, really, really cute if Even you guys don't know. Even maybe a snowy. Mm -hmm. Snowy when, owl, when like Harry Potter has. are really tough up north, sometimes <clears throat> the snowy owls come to Iowa because we're an easier place for them to find food. That's a great privilege when you get to see a snowy. It's mm -hmm. a privilege to see any of these beautiful it creatures. It really is. <laughs> yeah, what's your question? Yeah. What was that? Oh, sorry. Um, we're going to do her and then we'll do you, okay? What was your question? How old are they both? I think you asked the same thing, didn't you? Basically. Okay. Um, Sarah Owl is, hmm. she was really, really, year. yeah, she was pretty young when she came to us, going on two. Two in the spring, mm -hmm. in the spring. okay. And then Rachel is not that much older. Um, I think her hatch year was at 2015. So she'll be, she'll be four this year. Rachel Peregrine Falcon will turn four this year. So, anybody else have a question? Did you have another one? Yep, she's three right now. Yeah. It's a question oh. way in the back. Yeah, what's your question? Do any of them eat cats? Uh, no. <laughs> no, they don't. Thankfully. I have three, so I'm just like, oh, no. Um, no, I, I, I think that sometimes there's a myth that, that small dogs or cats could be whisked away by by a big bird of prey, but um, I, I don't think that's really true. That would <laughs> rarely, rarely happen. It would be a pretty it, desperate time, I think, for a, a bird to go after a cat, because the cat's got claws too. It could fight back, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what's your question? Yeah. Uh, well, I think Caden Falcon is a yeah. falcon. One of the smallest falcons? They're actually one of the bigger falcons. They're, um, she's not huge. I think there's some that are bigger than peregrines, right? Yeah. Um, but there's um, kestrels, which are small falcons, and there's also merlins, which are small falcons. There's some that are, they kind of, they kind of uh, range in height and size. So there's some teeny tiny ones, and there's some bigger ones. How much like, does that nice big peregrine weigh? Yeah. What do you guys Ooh. think these birds weigh? That's a great question. Anybody want to take a guess? What about you? Well, we'll talk about that in just a second. First, what do you think she weighs? Um, 35. 35 pounds? You think well, so? Well, let's convert that to ounces. I'm pretty strong <laughs> then, huh? <laughs> That's a good guess. She actually weighs probably less than a pound, about a, two pounds? Two pounds? Two pounds yeah. All right. She's about two pounds is all. So if you think about it, birds have hollow bones, which keeps them lightweight because they need to be able to fly. And they've got a lot of feathers. There's a lot of feathers in there. And that makes her look a lot bigger than, than she actually might be. We've got some weights for you guys to try out later on if you mm -hmm. want to see um, what it would be like to hold her mm -hmm. and what it would be like to hold Sarah out. And Miss, Miss Sarah <clears throat> weighs about the same as a banana. Yep. <laughs> Not a whole lot. <laughs> Did you have a question? No? Nope. Oh, I thought you had your hand up. Anybody else questions? Yeah. Superman. You think they can fly without being really good? They can, they can fly if they're injured. They can fly, but some of them can't fly quite well enough to be back out in the wild. And these guys, like, like the peregrine is a really, really good, strong flyer, but they also are able to glide mm -hmm. and kind of take work like a kite and are able to just kind of slip across the skies without a lot of effort. And owls like to sit high in a tree and, as I said, listen for their prey. And then they don't do a lot of flapping. That takes way too much energy. They just spread their wings out and they just kind of glide down. 
So they would, will do more gliding than flapping. If they're on the ground or they have to take off, of course they're going to flap, flap, flap. Owls are also able to flap and fly very quietly. You know, sometimes people think owls are kind of spooky creatures. And I think part of that is because they have a strange call. Stretching. They're active at night, and they fly so quietly, we don't hear them. And all of a sudden, we, there they are, and they, they have a startle factor. So right. she is doing oh. some gutter fluttering here. She's kind of making her throat go in and out. And that's something she does to cool herself. She's a little bit nervous, I think. What do you think? <laughs> yep, they are good at flying. That's what they do. I think it might be time to take the birds a little closer if we yeah. can so people can get a little bit better look at them. And then I think if everybody's going to have to sit really still while we do this. Mm -hmm. And then when we come back up to the front of the room, if anyone wants to leave, they're welcome to do that. If you want to stay and get a little closer look at some of the biofacts we have here. We have some wings and some talons and things that you can look at closer. So do you want to start out with sure. Rachel? And yeah. All right. Uh, could we have this middle aisle cleared right here? Can you scoot over, please? Uh -huh. Thank you. All right. I'm going to walk by with Sarah, uh, Rachel Peregrine. So what I need is everybody to stay very, very still. Do not try to touch her. Sure. Keep your hands to yes. yourself, please. Can you guys kind of see what I was talking about before? She's all right. <laughs> she can't get anybody. You can kind of see a little better. You can definitely see her big talons better, right? I think she's about done. <laughs> yeah, she's been really good. Come you know, birds, you they have a limit to their patience. They're not yep. used to being in rooms like this indoors. Just like we all do. We're people. like, nope, I'm done with that. They feel the same way sometimes. Walk her through here. Okay. I'll start to bring Sarah around, and I think I'm going to go this way past the piano, and then I'll come Good back job. up the middle aisle. Did y'all get a little air conditioning there? So. It's nice on a hot day when they do that. Oh, she's on alert. See how <laughs> she has her tufts up? She's much more Good comfortable job, when she's higher than when I bring her down low. She says, well, I'm getting kind of close to all these big, scary kids. <clears throat> Good job, Rachel. You can see her little talons. I don't know. She's looking at something up front. Do you guys see when she puffed her feathers all up and kind of shook out? That's called a rouse. That's a sign that she's pretty contented. When a bird does that, that means they're feeling pretty good. <clears throat> Sarah, you don't want to look at anybody. There she comes. She seems OK. Closer look at her. Yeah. Here, I'll come around the other side of you. There we go. <laughs> she's, she's being very talkative in her little soft voice. She says, oh, I don't know about all of this. Yeah, she, her tufts are up. Well, stay back. Huh? When you come towards her, that kind of frightens her. All right, we'll go down the center aisle, and then we'll let people who want to go can go. And those who want to get a, 
Okay, I need everybody yeah. one more quick walk yeah, I'll just walk down this so these kids can get a... She does, doesn't she? You guys have done such an excellent job today. Yeah. Y'all had great yeah. questions. <clears throat> so. All right. Well, I think at this point, um, if anybody has had enough and wants to go, then we are going to open it up and you can take off if you want to, um, quietly and slowly, please. Mm -hmm. um, anybody who wants to stick around and check out some of our uh, cool wings and feet, uh, maybe get a little bit closer look at the birds, um, you can stick around, but we need everybody to still be pretty, pretty still and quiet. So thank you all very much for coming. And we hope to see you again soon.